time slips. Where do I begin? Well, I guess let's just start with history, but it, I've been watching over this for years, years and years. Um, but, you know, let me just start at the beginning. Um, now, there were about five guys that were, um, you know, initially involved with uh, Rare, uh, the developer that's behind uh, GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64, and also Perfect Dark. Um, they're, that team is now uh, heavily invested in Microsoft, um, kind of doing their own thing now. Um, and they're also kind of, uh, I think they're kind of MIA from their initial <laughs> initial vision anyway. But anyway, so we have five guys that decided that, you know, after uh, coming up with the multiplayer aspect of GoldenEye um, and uh, doing a bit of the concept work for Perfect Dark that they decided, hey, you know what, um, we're going to, we want to do our own thing. And so they created Free Radical Design. I think the name should explain it. Um, I guess they formed April of 1999, and their first project was, uh, I guess it was a serious cinematic experience. Um, you know, this is before, you know, quite a bit before, you know, that was even considered, you know. Uh, although, you know, I guess Metal Gear Solid had, you know, been one of the, I thought, yeah, I think that Metal Gear Solid is the first to really consider that. Um, so I guess that, you know, it was like, hey, you know what? We want to take that to the next level. Um, I think that, that, you know, they had been working with concepts for that. And then for, you know, during the meantime, they had been uh, involved in a project that they just simply called multiplayer. And then just... You know, that led to the full development of Time Splitters, uh, finally released in 2000. So it was about a year of development before, you know, like, hey, we've got our own. It was a launch type for the PlayStation 2. Uh, and obviously, since, um, you know, it was under IADOS, um, you know, they were, they were an independent developer. It wasn't, you know, ex you know, like exclusive for Sony or no loyalty or anything like that, really. I mean, you know, it's, uh, Unless they're being, you know, paid directly from Sony to be exclusive, you know, that's that's gonna be how it is. So, you know, Time Splitters Two, uh which is considered, you know, the pinnacle of the Time Splitter series was released in uh, late two thousand two, like October, at the end of that anyway. It um some of them, you know, just the different markets they they're different and so anyway, um, that is considered the pinnacle of uh, that series. Um, uh, there's, I, mean, I I really don't think you can really go wrong with that game. It's it's a tough game, that's for sure. Um, especially going back to it nowadays. Um, but yeah, it's very very fun, very satisfying. Um. And yet that was still published with Eidos. I think that, um, you know, after that game, you know, they had actually finally gotten all the me gameplay mechanics down for their uh, initial uh, project that they had started, um, which had now been finally, you know, uh, called Second Sight. And uh, with that game, um, I guess that they, they just figured out that, uh, you know, um, you know, we're not completely, you know, we're, you know, loyal to our employees and our, you know, to our uh, fans, you know, that's it. We're not really looking to, you know, keep a lasting relationship with uh, IADO. So they had, you know, pursued, uh, they had let her, their contract with uh, IADO expire, essentially. And uh, they had pursued uh, other uh, publishers for, you know, their future games. Um, initially they had looked at Activision, um, but I guess Activision didn't like their, uh, idea for, um, their game, uh, um, for Second Sight, and then they quickly ran into Codemasters, and they said, okay, you know, we can do it. Problem is, is that, 
Um, second Sight, it's you know, it's I, I definitely recommend playing it. Uh, it's a it's a psychological sort of game um, where it kind of delves into you know some of the telekinesis and a whole bunch of different you know psychic powers that your character can do. Um, and from anyway, there was a, another game that came out with you know pretty much the same concept, although um, you know obviously directed differently. It wasn't like the same copies, but you know. That game, I think, I mean, it obviously kind of robbed the uh, attention away from that. Um, I can't remember what what it's called, but I I saw it playing in arcades and whatnot. But anyway, um, there's about uh, you know from there, uh, they were also in the works for uh, their third time splitters, Future Perfect, and uh, at that time they noticed that hey, you know, our sales are doing terribly under. Codemasters, so let's keep moving along. And so we're in our uh, little episode with EA. Um, they eventually did, you know, uh, sign on with EA and kept the project underneath them. And uh, that's, um, it went this whole like battle after battle with them. Um, the first problem was a wide advertisement. I think I've seen only one. Ad, you know, one ad, it was in a magazine, you know, from, well, uh, the official PlayStation magazine way back when, and that was it, that was it of that game, um, and that's all they did, and while they were doing, while, uh, EA was, uh, not running, uh, very many advertisements for that, uh, I saw plenty of advertisements for, uh, GoldenEye Rogue Agents, yeah, if you play that game, it's nothing like the original. It's it's not too pretty. It's not too good. It doesn't play very well at all. And um, they actually had the gall to actually go up to uh, the management for Free Radical and say, hey, you know, we have our own GoldenEye game going. You know, we have uh, we currently have the rights for it. Um, you know, while they wouldn't even you know they wouldn't even show any of the you know uh, code or. You know, they wouldn't even show any sort of gameplay to them. They're just, you know, hey, you know, we're doing this and we're gonna heavily market this because we know that everyone is going to, you know, soak this up because you know, hey, they were looking for, uh, you know, uh, something that could, you know, fight against uh, what you know, Call of Duty Two at the time. So, uh, and you know, also they had this, all those Medal of Honor games too. So, and, you know, it was the early. Um, World War Two saturation uh, FPS games, and <laughs> nowadays you don't hardly see that, you know. Um, anyway, uh, the next problem was uh, changes to the uh, to the initial ver- uh, vision of Time Sliders. Um, I think that like their EA's initial pushback was, hey, you know, there's no um, there's no cohesive vision. Like, we can't, there's no one person that we can just put on the box. Well, they eventually did. Um, I mean, like, in the U.S., we have this copy. Um, you know, we have Cortez on Time Splitter Sale. So that led to uh, Cortez again. Here we go. Cortez again on Future Perfect. You know, and that's how they did. You know, um, they made, you know, while the single player to the Time Splitters 2 doesn't really focus on Cortez too much. I mean, it, it kind of does the whole time gate thing where protagonist turns it into the person in that time period. Uh, this he teleports directly into different time periods, and you know you're still Cortez essentially. So I'm guessing that it was they thought that their audience was too confused with that whole problem, if it was a problem at all. But you know. I got it, you know. I'm sure about plenty of others did, right? Um, but anyway, uh, they they thought, well, well, if you take a look here, uh, let's zoom in a bit. Well, you can see that there's a bit of that inspiration from uh, a specific actor. I, I won't name him. I'm sure they can figure it out. <laughs> um. From there, we have, uh, you know, it, they focused a lot on single player. And, you know, I kind of like that. I think that they did a good job on the single player, you know, even with uh, the change in vision, essentially. I mean, I think that, 
it wasn't exactly what they really wanted. Um, you know, because from I've just read an article today where uh, the senior programmer for Free Radical had finally admitted that um, Don Matrick, you know the guy, if you've seen uh, those Microsoft keynotes of Xbox One, that guy was with EA before that, and he had criticized Free Radical of uh, that they had to get this out on. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, get this out as soon as possible. Otherwise, you know, it would be $50 million on EA for each, uh, release cycle, essentially. Um, you know, and, you know, damn, you know, quality. We need to have this out on time, you know. So, you know, in his, you know, paraphrasing his words is like, well, you know, kind of comes to show that they're, more interested in the corporate bottom line than you know their actual clients. Oh man. <laughs> well, you know, what can you do? I mean you know, it is as part of it is their money. Not only did they do that, but all the stuff before that where they did so little marketing on such a great game. I think that it's I mean going on to X Link you know, over a local area connection. Yeah, it's so fun to you know, be able to play that again. Um yeah. The last thing that EA did, you know, to screw their customers over after they screwed their developers over, but they cut they cut Times Flower's future perfect servers one year after release. One year. And you know, they did that to a lot of other games that totally didn't deserve that. And it was like their last servers that they cut off were for uh what was it, Burnout Three. That's the last one that I remember. And it's like, well, apparently they they liked longevity with Criterion, which uh, you know, I think that they purchased these guys, but you know. So that I guess that was their uh, justified cost anyway. So anyway. Their next project they obviously got away from EA after that whole uh, crap fest with EA. Um, it was with Ubisoft. So they had pitched they had pitched another serious game after uh, um, after sorry Second Sight. That's with uh, their initial vision was the Iraqi War. You know, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, and, you know, kind of the U.S. involvement of it, and they were definitely looking to make it controversial, you know. Um, and apparently Ubi just did not like that at all. So they said, no, nope. time to go back and, uh, you know, re you've got to redo the vision of this. Uh, we can't, you know, we can't be seen selling a controversial game. So they did. And uh, what we got was a game set about uh, the year 2015, with a PMC that is owned by a larger pharmaceutical company, and they, uh, you're a soldier that was recently hired, apparently, or just out of, uh, their, um, training school, and was never, you know, introduced to this, uh, um, to, uh, their, you know, uh, pharmaceutical product simply named Nectar. Um, you know, that raises a, a bit of a flag with me, you know, so, you know, I think that, yeah, I, I think that just the premise just wasn't there, I mean, it was just rushed or something, you know, it was where, you know, they had to come up with something really quickly in order to make, uh, in order to make it with Ubisoft, and apparently, you know, I mean, it was, uh, I think... I know that it was initially uh, announced, what, 2007? Early 2007, and, you know, the game was, you know, released in 2008. Um, May of 2008, to be precise. Uh, more precise, anyway. I don't remember the exact date. May 10th? Um, so, with that, we have a lot of dialogue issues, a lot of story issues. Um... And even, uh, a lot, you know, uh, re reviews will say that there are a lot of, uh, 
you know, technical issues, you know, like with frame rate stuttering. And what do you know? Um, it was at when Ubisoft decided, okay, so we're going to strike a deal with Sony um, to make it, you know, exclusive to the PS3 because it was also, uh, you know, looking to be released on PC and 360 at the time. Pretty radical. Like, no, we can't do that. We can't do it. They went, screw we're doing it anyway. So they had to, they really had to, you know, they asked for an extension to kind of redo the code base to try and, uh, you know, make it platform ex exclusive, which it wasn't. But, you know, um, even with the extension of time, it just wasn't enough to, you know, uh, smooth everything out, especially in single player, because you, know, you see, you see a lot of things. I mean, they have, you know, a uh, four-player co-op in, in the campaign. Um, you know, it in you know some of the people can be playing split screen at the same time. It's one of the very few games I can do that on PlayStation Three, let alone the seventh generation of consoles. Um, it, and you know, the gameplay-wise, I think it's fine. Um, th those technical issues I've seen, yeah, those are issues, and uh, resolution wasn't good. Um. But, you know, that's what they had to work with in such little time for, you know, oh, we're making this exclusive now. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, after that, oh, while they were doing this, um, they were also on a secret project with LucasArts. I had been following their site for a while, and it was, um, you know, just, it was rumored a uh, thing with LucasArts. Like, okay. Came to find out that uh, right when they went into this administration, um, December 17th, 2008, that an employee leaked some footage of uh, off screen, you know, off screen footage of a Battlefront 3 trailer. Um, it was probably one of their pitches that they were using with LucasArts. Um, that you know. It looked amazing, even off screen. So it was like a big, big change from these, anyway, because LucasArts obviously wanted to make sure that it was not uh, platform exclusive. Um, and you know, from there, well, let's just go into Battlefront. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that out of any publisher, I'd still hate Luke starts the most out of what they did with Free Radical Design. They they are the direct target for their demise. I mean, Don Matrick, what I've learned today, he's just a part of a long line of people that had led to Free Radical Design's demise. So, what had happened was that uh, they had been working on. Uh, Battlefront 3, probably late 2007, they started that project then, and everything had been going fine until um, early 2008. Oh no, it wouldn't be late 2007, I think that they probably spent a year before this whole thing happened, where if you've heard of the game Fracture, uh, it was supposed to be in, you know a technically ambitious game, much like if you've seen you know, the, four, the first Force Unleashed with a new game engine that could uh, do a lot of terraforming instead of, you know, um, you know, shattering walls or whatever Force Unleashed, you know, uh, says that it can do. With that, um, gameplay was very drab. The storyline was very drab, too. I mean, it just wasn't very well received at all. And uh, I think it, their president's name at the time was Jim Ward and he was uh, very open with free radical design you know he's like you know you guys keep doing what you do you know uh, we know we know exactly you know you we know that you can do a very good job with a third slash first person game so you know keep doing what you're doing and um and it was very ambitious because they were looking to incorporate you know land to space battles and there are plenty, you know, plenty of sites that will kind of go over everything with this, and I, you know, I might have to link some of it. But essentially, Ward left the company after 
poor reception of Frankster. In mean, one game, he was gone. And then came in uh, President uh, Daryl Rodriguez, who decided that he needed to change the company's vision to make everything internally based. Um, that you know, only LucasArts or anyone that any subsidiary that they you know uh, buy out would you know continue making games. So, free radical, they weren't going to be bought out. Um, yeah, I don't think I doubt that that was even on the table. You know, could we, you know, could we purchase your uh, studio for you know an X million uh, amount of dollars or something? Um, I don't, I don't even know if that was even on the table. But what I do know is on the table is that their LucasArts legal team was on all meetings and discussions with. Uh, free articles designed when Daryl Rodriguez got on. You know, like, um, and their biggest thing was okay. Well, we don't. You know, we see that you guys are making progress, but not enough. So we're going to. Uh, uh, I think that we need to wait for another uh, uh, another meeting before we can decide whether we need to where, whether we should pay you or not. So yeah, uh, we'll see you next month, okay? Or see you in you know another six weeks. Turns out that they decided to not pay for six months of work uh, on this project, and it six weeks or sorry six months of work. Um, you know that's that's definitely cutting into uh, a lot of the financial. Uh, dealing with an independent studio, and they had gone 140 employees to work on Hades for Ubisoft and Battlefront 3 with LucasArts. And uh, that would be even considered a conservative number now. Um, and then, you know, they obviously had concept artists going on for, uh, you know, Time Splitters 4, which they had announced as well. Um, that they were doing, even though that they didn't ink a publisher for that, um, so you know you were splitting things up, and you're. I think that they were using the resources pretty wisely, and uh, to be considered. Um, so once the LucasArts said, oh, after six months they hadn't paid them, they're like, okay, we're just going to cancel the project. Okay, thanks, bye. And by that time, I mean. They were, you know, they were out of money, and uh, they were scrambling to, um, you know, try and, you know, they were looking for a legal solution for that. They didn't have the money for that to go against Lucas, George Lucas, <laughs> and his, you know, I'm pretty sure that he would be more than happy to, you know, send as some sort of legal team against them and put them into multi million, uh dollar um suit before they would be able to get a single penny back um so with that they had very little choice you know they were looking to do uh, uh time splitters 4 and a golden eye remake pitch um various pitches you know and they went to activision to do this um and you know they were, you know they built the whole damn level from the first you know first part of the game, and uh, they're like, yeah, we're impressed, but uh, you know we'll get back to you on that, and they never did. But of course, after you know um, administration had happened, December seventeenth, two thousand eight, <laughs> um, you know it was a staff of one forty, drastically cut to twenty. Um, there was, uh, you know, the office was locked. There was only one guy right in front of it that was, uh, letting people in. It was only letting the top 20 people in. And, you know, it's a pretty much collect work. Um, you know, be able to kind of get everything all taken care of. And at least, uh, from what I read, um, uh, main guys and, you know, free radical design made sure that, you know, everyone was still going to receive their Christmas bonuses like they had, you know, before. And, uh, after, you know, after, uh, after that whole thing on the 17th, it was, 
and nothing was happening. So they were waiting to for someone to possibly buy the studio, in which Crytek did. So, yeah, uh, Crytek acquired them January, January 22nd. They are actually putting them to good use now. But you have guys like David Doak, um, you simply quit the industry. He hasn't been back for five years. Uh, it's been almost five years now. Well, four and a half now. Well, more than four and a half, anyway. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's... I mean, it's a real tragedy, I think. Um, you have, you know, 120 people, you know, just lose their jobs in the industry. And, you know, um, I guess the biggest mistake was that they decided to, uh, you know, not stick with Iados. Which, I mean, I guess from, it sounds like, you know, they weren't, it looked like Iados wasn't doing too, you know, they weren't doing too much with the Time Splitters franchise, you know, for the first two. But I think that, you know, like Time Splitters 2, it still sold 2.5 million. And, it, you know, even without a ton of marketing. This was before, uh, you know, gaming got really popular. This was well before Call of Duty 4 had uh, really made it a uh, pipe, uh, sorry, a pop culture uh, ph phenomenon, really. Um, this is before, you know, Facebook had gotten started and the Facebook gaming, um, you know, this is before, you know, mobile games really started to take action. I mean, you know, in 2002, you wouldn't even think that you'd be able to play a game on your cell phone or, uh, you know, welcome to 2013. You know, you can make a 99 cent game and you can become a millionaire. And this is the problem. This is the problem with uh, the market with a lot of people's marketing strategy or th what they think that it would be a marketing strategy. A lot of these people, you know, and you know, when uh, Free Radical was thinking that, you know, you know, um, we're going to pitch Time Splitters for marketers from publisher side, it's not marketable. There's no one person that we could put on the cover. Like, does there even need to be? I mean, like, you know, take Battlefield 3 and 4 for, you know, now, um, you only get the, well, you get the, maybe the front of a soldier's face, and you don't even really see it, you know, there's no, there's no really recognizable protagonist, but, you know, it's, it's ridiculous how publishers, and it's like, no, you know, you have hundreds of characters, and you, we can't figure out which ones we want to feature, you know? And it's like, is this a joke? <laughs> no, it wasn't a joke. It sold 2.5 million within one year of its release. There, that's no joke at all. Not back in late 2002. And so, here's what I have for market. Single player. It's always been about going back in time to fix the, tam the tamper past. The race of uh, beings called time splitters, um, which we find out that were, were genetically engineered. Um, they essentially are sent back in time to you know in various uh, periods of uh, uh, you know kind of modern history um, to mess with the time period to uh, you know screw uh, screw a lot of the towns over. Um, you know, take over a lot of different parts and uh, all sorts of stuff um and then you know as the protagonist um you you, know, you warp into the various time periods and uh you know you get the time crystal you defeat the baddies and you're into the next area you know it's that's not too tough this can be made that could be uh put into a 30 second commercial you know, it mainly features the alien race, or, you know, whatever. I guess it's technically not alien race. It's just a genetically engineered race, anyway. Um, second part, multiplayer, which has been, you know, the staple of the, of the whole thing. I mean, it was considered a multiplayer game when we were first conceptualizing it. It's fast and frantic. Huge character and weapon selection. I mean, you know, you're there are probably I think the count is around 160 for all three games, and there are a lot of the 
characters that go between all three games. And yeah, weapon selection too is uh you know you could prob you probably have at least forty in each game, and including you know, uh like a brick you know, or you know a lot of different mines or grenades. You know, you could change you know which weapons you want to use and you know in the arcade uh, section you know in your multiplayer game. And that's one of my favorite parts about it is just being able to like create a a remote mine only game or you know, like proximity mines <laughs> that's ridiculous or you know just throwing bricks around um or you know you could even do kind of a behead the undead uh challenge uh, you know on your own too um one other thing would be uh map maker that's that's a that was a big deal and i guess that was uh something that maybe iodos was initially pushing against is that you know uh you have all these maps you're putting in a lot of time and you know for players to be able to actually create maps of their own um i don't think that i think that we'd rather that we push it out quickly rather than you know you know incorporate that feature and you know at least ea allowed map maker because nowadays they would not absolutely not and that, you know that would definitely suck if, if it you know future perfect were trying to be released you know at this day um, because I don't think that, you know, you would get, you know, a hundred of characters without, you know, DLC characters, you know, um, or, you know, being able to actually make your own maps. Um, I just think that that would be impossible with them nowadays. Well, I guess they are kind of changing, but, you know, different, different day. Um, uh, and then another smaller feature would be the fully customizable controller. You know, you can switch all the buttons around. So, like, if you wanted to, you could fire by hitting the left, you know, like the left trigger in or something. You know, um, you know, all sorts of different combinations, I guess. So, you know, that was always something that, you know, that always, that always had me weird because, you know, uh, Flutters was one of my first FPS games on the console, so I was like, "Well, I can't believe that a lot of these other console games just can't you know, map uh, and control so easily." So yeah, I was like, "Well, uh, why aren't there uh, so many other games like this?" Uh, so I, I think that that's. I think that that could be marketed. I think that, you know, what I did, I I went way into detail, but I think that to make a 30-second commercial for any of these games, time splitters are inv invading all these time periods, and you're uh, taking, you know, you're uh, going in, you're, you're trying to take back the past. And then multiplayer, of course. And that's the weirdest thing. Is that it's it's one of the first multiplayer centric games, you know, as well as Counter Strike. Apparently, they were early for their time. Apparently, because EA loves their multiplayer games now, but they don't want to take time splitters because it's apparently too much of a risk. Uh, last part is legacy of time splitters is satire. Um, it never took itself seriously. Um, and, you know, it's that circle on movie genres. I mean, Harry Zipper is supposed to be a mix of James, James Bond and uh, Austin Powers. And then you have uh, Captain Nash, who is, uh, you know, ex well, I guess he's he would be an older Indiana Jones, maybe like Indy's father, you know, Sean Connery, um, or his cousin or something. <laughs> uh, Maybe it's caution. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and you know, uh, with the Ten Splitters Four, uh, you know, their reveal, it was with Halo. Uh, it was the the monkey and the Spartan suit, and you had uh different. You know, they incorporated the monkey with the Gears of War icon, and uh, just a whole bunch of other different wacky ideas too that weren't necessarily in games, but they definitely could. I mean, I know that they could definitely. Uh, make parodies of different games anyway, other first person shooters or whatever, whatever have you. So, anyway, I guess what we have for the future is well, I mean, currently we have 
uh, if you are wanting to play any sort of games, uh, console games that still incorporates, you know, some aspect of uh, Free Radical, uh, look for Crisis 2 and 3 multiplayer, because Free Radical Design, or Crytek UK now, or Crytek Nottingham, uh, to be more precise, is, uh, you know, they worked on that solely. They're also currently working on Homefront 2, um, although that the title was uh, being published by THQ, they went bankrupt, and uh, Crytek bought, bought, the, <laughs> bought the rights back for that, so I guess uh, they're going to figure out some way to uh, publish that, either themselves or with someone else. And, uh, well, you know, it's a, if you're looking for probably what Hayes was really looking to do, play Spec Ops Online. That's probably the best thing uh, um, that was that they were really looking to do is that, you know, like all these modern day shooters, like they really don't try to question what you're doing. And, you know, that's what Second Sight had done. You know, like what are all these uh, Black Ops projects and, you know, what the government really doing? Are they really helping us out? <laughs> um, and then, you know, like with Hayes, like, you know, can you really trust what a PMC or a pharmaceutical company is giving you? You know, can you, who can you really trust day to day? You know, um, so I think that that was a, if that's a good message that you can get out of Hayes, that's what you can do. Otherwise, play multiplayer or just play co op and mute all the characters. <laughs> um, terrible dialogue, anyway. But yeah. Um, last, last thing that I'm looking forward to, I guess it's by the end of this year, will be Time Splitters Rewind. It's a fan project that, um, is using the CryEngine 3. Um, it's, it'll be free to play. Uh, it'll be, I, I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, what they're, what these guys are, you know, up to anyway. Uh, and I hope to help them in any way. So, I guess one last thing on my mind is that I'll consider doing a Time Splitters 2 and Future Perfect run in chronological order. I'll have to, you know, edit everything to be put in one run. Um, I might have to do some sort of title, you know, some titles with that. Um, it'll, I guess it'll be my first real run um, with that. So anyway, I know that I'm running way over here, but this had to be said. I mean... I can't put it in any shorter words. I mean, there's so much uh, that I could really do with this. I, I could keep going on. There's so much knowledge that I have over, you know, Time Splitters 4, Haze, and, you know, Battlefront 3. Um, I could probably go for another 30 minutes with all the crap that happened, but I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions, uh, you know, you know where you can reach me. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.